In March 2020, filmmaker Todd Field got a phone call from Top Brass at Focus Features with an offer. Peter Kajowski and Kiska Higgs at Focus said, um, write whatever you like. Stuck at home during the first pandemic lockdown, he figured this was his chance to write a story about a character he'd been carrying around in his head for more than a decade, a classical music conductor. Once I started, it was about 12 weeks, and I, I really had no reasonable expectation that the studio would ever want to make the film. I kind of just wrote it because it felt like the world was ending and who even knew if there was going to be movies on the other side of whatever we were, you know, facing. And I told them that at the time I said, I'm going to hand you a script and you're not going to want to make it, but don't <laughs> worry. Uh, I'll write something else for you. So you don't feel like I stole your money. Um, and I was shocked and somewhat horrified when they said that not only did they want to make it, but they wanted to make it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> what what was horrifying about that? That's what most people dream about. I think it's always horrifying when you actually um, have to make a film. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out, he had nothing to be afraid of. The movie he made is called Tar, one of the most celebrated of the year. But it definitely deals with some modern horrors. It's the story of Lydia Tar, an American conductor who leads the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. She's exalted cater to a great artist living a privileged life, which slowly turns into a nightmare as first her colleagues and then her lover and then herself come to terms with what she's done to get power and how she's abused it. I'm Rico Galliano and welcome back to the Mubi podcast. Mubi is the streaming service that curates great cinema. On this show, we tell you the stories behind great cinema. Season three is coming soon. But today, one more special episode to tide you over. It is my interview with Todd Field about Tar. Back in the early 90s, he graduated from my alma mater, actually, AFI, the American Film Institute. And this is only his third feature since then. But just like his other movies, it's up for a raft of Oscars, including for Best Film, Field's Writing and Direction, and his star Kate Blanchett's performance. She actually already won a Golden Globe for that. And since the next season of this show is all about music in movies... I thought Field was just the guy to talk to. He actually played in jazz bands, and he entered college on a music scholarship. As an actor, he portrayed a pianist in Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut. But as you'll hear later, when he dreamt up the character of musician Lydia Tarr, music was the last thing on his mind. First up, though, I pressed him to tell me a little more about the horror of getting a green light. I mean, one of the things that you're, you're you know, you're a, a, a you were a fellow at, at AFI as I was, and I think part of the pleasure and the pain of that program was the fact that we had to do these cycle projects with such little turnaround. Yeah, these very quick turnaround shorts that we had to make, like many of it each semester. Right, and it didn't give you too much time to to think about it, and I think that there was a real a wisdom in that, just having to make decisions and hang a lantern and, and get to work, you know? And the problem with feature filmmaking often is that it moves uh, so glacially that there's plenty of opportunity for anxiety and fear. <laughs> <laughs> you know? so. That's interesting. I mean, like a mentor of yours was Stanley Kubrick, who also didn't take short amounts of time to make a movie. And I guess you got to watch him be fairly tortured too. Well, I'm, I, I do remember having that conversation with him and asking you know, gently saying, you know, um, is there a reason that you take such long periods of time? Because at that point in time, I had just been out of AFI for three years, actually a year, uh, mm. and had no um, forecast of what was ahead. I really thought I would just go off and, you know, make movies once a year or something, which is uh, far from <laughs> what, what occurred. But, and Stanley said, because it has to be something where I know I won't lose interest or I have a fair chance of not losing interest because the most horrifying thing would be to start something and get halfway through and realize that it no longer engages you, you know? Mm. And I think that that is the sort of, for anyone making a feature film, it is that, you know, the loneliness of the, of the long distance runner. You, you don't want to be on mile 10 or 12 and, and not want to finish the race, you know? Yeah, that was, I, I mean, this is something I was going to ask way later in this interview, but I'll go to it right now. How much when you are planning a movie, to what extent is this the most important thing that, you know, you say to yourself, in this case, I want to do this because I just like classical music and I want to do a film where I get to be around it for like several years. No, it had nothing. To, I had no interest in classical music whatsoever. I mean, that's not why I made the film. The backdrop was important because it's such a 
very simple frame of, of looking at a pyramid or in this case, a triangle in terms of a power structure. Mm -hmm. I was more interested in taking a character and, and putting her in some kind of cultural hierarchy um, and examining how that works. You know, what, what are the cornerstones of a, of a pyramid of power and, and who has to hold that up and, and who gains and who benefits and who feeds it and who is complicit in that. And how does somebody sit at the top of, of, of such a pyramid? Then let's talk about that character who I know you've said you dreamed up, you know, 10 years ago. Where did that character come from as sort of the vessel to examine power? Well, I work in the film business. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure that character sort of was birthed out of many parents. Let's put it that way. That's all you're going to say? Seriously? Well, this is, I, do you want me to get confessional? I mean, I, yep. You, you, well, I'm not. <laughs> um, well, let me, what's the essence of that character that was, that leapt into your mind? Like, I want to do a character who is what? I think it was just, you know, the idea that there's a reason people rise to power. And as this character would say, it's not always so polite. You know, there's always going to be some roadkill yeah, for someone mm. to reach that destination. That's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me about how people are enabled to exist like that and have been, you know, from the beginning of time. This is nothing new. Yeah, I, ask, I mean, for me, this is a movie that puts us in the mindset of a narcissist. And I mean, it's interesting to me that you've been carrying this character around for many, many years because the first thing that came to my mind was we've had several narcissists running major countries over the last few years. There's also a few asides about democracy in this movie. Lydia Tarr actually says at one point about her orchestra, this isn't a democracy. Did the politics of our modern world enter into your mind as you were structuring this? Well, certainly. And, and, and what she's saying actually, in fact, is untrue. If you were in a German orchestra, it actually is a democracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in, in actual fact, she doesn't necessarily have the right to do that. She's been granted that privilege essentially by the orchestra. And that orchestra is in fact led by the concert master. And in this case, that concert master is her partner. So yeah, yeah. that partner benefits from allowing her to be out front, you know, mm. in, in the spotlight. And she's sort of safely in the wings, but is doing a lot of scene shifting from yeah. the wings. She's an enabler. She's an enabler, and and she has the ear of that entire orchestra because she's the most powerful player in it. It, it. it actually occurs to me, you you know, you've said that you're not particularly interested in the classical world at, just for its own sake, and that this does have you know some political ramifications. Why not set this in the realm of politics? Why set this in the realm of the arts? Well, I mean, it's audio visual medium, and you can fit. A triangle in a frame. I mean, if you look at her on the podium, she's literally at the tip of a triangle, right? I mean, it's a very efficient way to very simply illustrate a power system, you know, if nothing mm. else. It's also, there's, I've always been fascinated by front of house, back of house, you know, whether it's a, a play or a film like The Dresser or, or what have you, but the idea of how does the show actually get on its feet, you know, and, and mm -hmm. what is the drama involved in that show? And, and that's a little bit different than, you know, political intrigue is fascinating and rich and interesting to a point, you know, or if she sat at, at the top of a media organization or something like that, or, or, or a, an energy company, anything. But mm -hmm, yeah. to actually be able to stand atop Mount Olympus and throw thunderbolts with your hands and have, <laughs> and have there be an explosion, which is what it's like to be a conductor, is, is, is fairly dramatic. You know, it's great. It does. It makes for a better movie in some instances. Although I will say it's like the Speaker of the House sits up on top of a podium looking down at an arc of people before them. That's a triangle, too. Well, it, it, you're right about that. Maybe maybe we do Tar 2, the center. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look for it. That'll be the most bizarre sequel ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, the comeback. What an interesting <laughs> franchise. Um, there's a scene, speaking of power, there's a scene that it's been the subject of a lot of conversation. I mean, before I saw the movie, I was reading you know, the reviews as I do, and most of them mention this scene. The scene where Lydia is teaching a conducting class, and she gets in an argument with this student who is conducting a, a very atonal piece by a modern female composer, and you want to set up the rest? Well, what's going on with the scene is she basically declares war on the atonal. So you're a violinist? Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, I can see why you would 
choose to conduct a piece like this. Must be a familiar pleasure in presiding over a bed of strings that behave as if they're tuning. Um, and she declares war on the eight tonal quite conveniently because the, the piece of music that she's torpedoing is by another woman who's very mm. celebrated, uh, who's very young mm. and beautiful uh, by her own accounts. But she, instead of talking about that, she's really kind of going after the student and basically saying, go back to this, this old dead white man thing. And yeah, instead the, of admitting that she's jealous of this other composer, she tells the student that he would be better off playing the classics. Yes. Have you ever played or, or conducted Bach? Honestly, as a BIPOC, pangender person, I would say Bach's misogynistic life makes it kind of impossible for me to take his music seriously. And when the student very politely says that they're not interested in that, she essentially guts him. But you see, the problem with enrolling herself as an ultrasonic epistemic dissident is that if Bach's talent can be reduced to his gender, birth, country, religion, sexuality, and so on, then so can yours. Here's what is interesting to me. The New Yorkers published two analyses of this movie, one by Richard Brody, one by Tavi Evanson, and they couldn't have more divergent takes on the movie and the scene. Brody's basically like, this is a regressive conservative movie about the evils of so-called cancel culture as embodied in this scene. And Tavi's like, this is an expose about artists who abuse power. And how surprised were you that you could get such totally different reads on this scene? Because to me, it's very clear what this scene is about. Well, it's thrilling. I mean, um, the scene is constructed in a way to be a punching bag for whatever you bring to it. You know, it's not, uh, I wouldn't offer any other interpretation of the scene. The only thing I would be sad about is if somebody watched the scene and was indifferent to it, you know? Um, I mean, the conversation itself is a useful tool for a character that's going to preach religion and purity and then violate that a half a dozen scenes later with their own hypocrisy. But this to me, this is what I'm saying. I 100% agree with you. So I don't understand how one can take this as a movie about, you know, the evils of so-called cancel culture when you've got at the heart of it the the person who is canceled is so hypocritical and has so many negative things. It's not like we're, I don't feel like we're totally sympathetic to this character. I do think we're fascinated by her, but it's not like this is a character that is ever painted as somebody that you can totally get behind. <laughs> she's, she's capricious and she's as full of hypocrisy as any of us. Let's put it that way. Where are you going? You fucking bitch. And you are a robot. So I want to talk a little bit about your return to filmmaking after a long hiatus there. And just to put this in personal terms, uh, we take a few months between the regular seasons of this podcast to research and do interviews and stuff. And every time that part's finished and we get back to actually writing and producing episodes, it feels like I'm the tin man <laughs> in need of oiling. I'm kind of like creaking back to life and figuring out how to move again. And that's after a few months. 15 years you right. took what yeah actually 16 years to be more actually 17 years to be to be more precise because we we shot little children in 2005 and it was released in 2006 um but who's counting right um <laughs> <laughs> my question being like what muscles were the hardest to flex again for you when you got back on a set um none because i haven't stopped shooting in 17 years i've been doing advertising so i mean i'm on the floor all the time um, I've been at the forefront with many other p commercial directors in terms of developing technology, uh, both uh, in the editorial areas and visual effect areas and camera systems long before they ever get to feature film or television directors. So I mm. shoot constantly. I, I actually feel much stronger than I did with my previous two films. The one difference was a, sort of the you know, moment where you realize, ah, oh, yeah, I remember, you know, I remember what it was like to get in this, on this animal again, which is the very first day of the shoot with, with the actors and to sit down the very first day with Kate Blanchett and Noemi Merlon and Nina Haas, that was like opening a door that had been locked firmly for a very long time for me. <laughs> and, and, and that was a, that was a revelation. And that made coming to work intensely um, exciting in a manner that, you know, working in advertising I never will. You mentioned Kate Blanchett and working with her. You've said you wrote this film with her in mind and that you wouldn't have made it without her, actually. What does she have that this movie could only get from her? Well, I had met Kate on another project that didn't happen about 10 years ago 
a script that Joan Didion and I had written together. And I didn't know Kate before then. I mean, I knew her work, obviously. But the time that we spent together talking about doing that uh, was some of the richest dialogue I'd had with another filmmaker. Hmm. She's not just looking at her character and what her character can do. She's looking at the entirety of it. Um, and when that project didn't happen and I sat down to write this, I just couldn't stop thinking about her. You know, clearly the quite impressive practical things that she had to master for this because she she's playing the piano. She's playing Bach note for note on screen. She's conducting for real. You know, she's speaking German. She's doing an American accent. She's she's doing all of these things. And, you know, what she would tell you is she would say poo poo about all that. Those were <laughs> those were givens. Those uh, you have to do that. But that but that's not what the character is. That's just the character's, you know, particulars. Um, and she's right about that. You know, we shot such an aggressive schedule. Um, we never looked at dailies. And it wasn't until Monica Willie and I were sitting in Scotland seven days a week watching the work where you see what's important about the performance is what she does with the character in an almost pointillistic way, just the tiny physical actions that she's mapped out, that when you see them in their entirety are rather breathtaking, you know? Like what? This very small things, the way uh, this character uh, is obsessed with intent listening, what she does with her hands, just tiny things, tiny things that have their own sort of rhythms and hues to them, you know? There's a moment early on in the movie and it repeats it later on. She's waiting to go out on stage for an interview with Adam Gopnik and she's trying to get to a point of relaxation before going on stage and then suddenly does this kind of like batting at her face and kind of brushing off her clothing. And it really struck me as an amazing moment that sort of gets something about what's going on inside of this character. Is that her then, or did that come from you? Well, where that came from was um, this character suffers from misophonia, you know, she, part of, and, and this is um, not uncommon for people that, that are conductors, where they're highly attenuated to noise and they can't stand sound that they can't control, which is probably why they're gravitated to this vocation in the first place. So in actual fact, mm. what she's doing there is she's responding to sounds that she's hearing in particular in the audience. Now, those sounds are described, the whole first page of the script is just one big black dense description of the sounds that she's hearing and what they're doing to her. So. Mm. The plan had always been that we would play her those sounds and she'd be responding to those sounds. But when we shot it, and I saw what she was doing physically to respond to those sounds, I realized it was so much better if we didn't hear what she heard. It was much better just to see what was mm. activating her. And yeah, I, I, that's a very good example and I brought, I'm glad you brought it up that sets the tone that that's table setting for her. And, and, and she's also doing a lot of other things. She's trying to get, she's trying to brush off energies. You know, she's going through ceremonies and she's going through, um, these things that she's done forever to calm herself enough to be able to go out and perform because of course that is the performance that this character is sort of self-constructing in the whole movie, that first interview with Adam Gopnik. Oh, true. So for her, the interview, and kind of her whole life or as much of a performance as, you know, a concert. Yeah. Ready for them? Um, I think it's interesting, by the way, that earlier you were talking about how scary it was to get the green light for this. But you're also saying that dealing with actors, which is the thing for you that was the hardest to get back into about directing a movie, was also the most exciting. Um, there was nothing hard about getting into it. I think my... What I was horrified about is the length of time. When I work in advertising, at the most, I'm gone for three weeks and then I go home, you know, mm. and, and it's on the air in front of the Olympics, you know, two days later. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and it's already in the rearview mirror. But when you work on a, on a film, you've got a couple of years of your life, you know, and away from your family and away from your children. And uh, if you care, you're working seven days a week and you're not sleeping well and your health is probably not so great. And so it's a huge amount of physical, emotional, and philosophical investment that you simply don't have in in these shorter sprints. Again, it's like the loneliness of the long distance runner. You know, mm. you you have to know: can I get through twenty six miles? And 
And, mm-hmm. and that's the fundamental question that, that you really don't know. Can you do it? Given that, do you, are you actually looking forward to uh, doing another film quickly? Or is it kind of like, okay, I, I'm happy doing these every decade. And in between, I can just do the quick hits of commercial work. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, it's a, uh, um, given the paltry output, uh, you know, post AFI, um, I, I would like to make another film quickly. We'll see, you know, we'll see whether it comes together or not. Um, Let's say I, I liked I, I like the twenty six miles. <laughs> I prefer it. Todd Field last week his movie Tar got nominated for six Oscars, and that is our special episode of the movie podcast for today. In just a few weeks, we're going to drop our full season three, telling the stories behind the legendary pairings of great songs and great movies. Guests include Donnie Darko director Richard Kelly, Noel Hogan of the band The Cranberries, and many more. All talking about movie tunes from dream pop to classical. Follow us wherever you get your podcast so you don't miss it. While you're at it, declare your love for this show by leaving a five-star review wherever you listen. It'll help others find and love us too. This show was hosted, written, and edited by me, Rico Galliano. Our booking producer was Jackson Musker. Mastering by Stephen Colon. Yuri Suzuki composed the theme music. Thanks this week to Kira McKenneth and Dallas Taylor. The show's executive produced by me, along with John Baranachea, Effie Cecharel, Daniel Kasman, and Michael Taka. Thanks for listening. Be safe. Now go watch some movies. Movies.